Hi everyone, today uh, we're doing another exciting installment of Physics 144 and today's topic is going to be impulse and momentum. This is kind of the next story in or the next chapter in our story about uh, Newtonian mechanics and the application of Newton's second law. So without further ado, let's consider what we use uh, impulse and momentum for. Well, let's start out by actually defining momentum. This is uh, stems from an alternative view of Newton's second law. And I'll just note that in our class so far, we've been assuming that the force here was equal to the mass times the acceleration. And we can rewrite using the rules of calculus that the acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. And since mass is a constant, I can pull this inside the integral and say that the time derivative of some quantity, which is the mass times the velocity, is going to be equal to the force. And we call that quantity, the mass times the velocity, equal to the momentum. A few things about the momentum. Number one, it's a vector because velocity is a vector and mass is a scalar. To multiply those two uh, together, we get a uh, vector that is, uh, that is aligned with the velocity vector. Second point, uh, momentum has no uh, unit. It's There's no joule, there's no newton or anything. It has no specific unit. The unit on momentum is a kilogram meter per second, which you can look at the m times v and figure that out. It doesn't have a special name. Other quantities laugh at momentum. It cries itself to sleep at night. But we can come back to Newton's second law and see that d by dt uh, is, of this quantity, momentum, uh, is the force. So we can rewrite Newton's second law as not f equals ma, but as the time derivative of momentum. And that's going to give us the capacity to solve problems with varying mass. And since we can do things like the chain rule, we know that this is then m times dv by dt plus v times dm by dt. And this allows us to start to solve variable mass problems. So what happens when the mass in our system is changing? And we'll get to that next week when we explore rockets and other variable mass uh, problems. But for now, let's consider the impulse momentum theorem, which arises from F equals ma, Newton's second law, or F is dp by dt. And what we're going to do is take that time derivative and integrate it. So we will bring up our uh, time differential and integrate the uh, left side of this equation as the time initial to time final integral of F times over the time interval is the time integral of dp, which is what was left on the uh, right-hand side here. And the integral of a differential is just the difference of the quantities, so p final times minus p initial, or the change in momentum. And then we look at this quantity over here on the left side of the equation, and we call that quantity something else. We call that the impulse. It has units of momentum, so a kilogram times meter per second, and therefore we have a momentum, uh, or sorry, we have an impulse, and that's the time integral of a force. And if we relate these, we see that the impulse is leads to changes in momentum. So impulse changes momentum, and here it's a good opportunity to draw an analogy to between impulse and momentum and energy and work. The work changes the energy of a system. The work that's done on a system changes its energy. Positive work leads to an increase in energy. By exact parallel construction, the impulse on a system changes its momentum. And so that allows us to think about how a uh, momentum of a system will change if it's uh, treated with a integral of the force over time. Remember that work is an integral of force over a displacement. This is the integral of force over time. So one is integral of force over space. The impulse is the integral of force over time. Now, I want to bring up one other mathematical fact before we get down to actually applying this, which is impulses allow us to develop the idea of an average force 
if the force is varying in time. And this idea comes from calculus, which is how we define the average value of a function. And mathematically, what we do is we have some function here, which is in pink uh, uh, here and has some sort of curvy value. It's going to have an integral, which is the area under the curve. Uh, so an area a bit like that. So that integral there is going to have some value when I integrate it from a to b. We're going to define the average value of a function using this little notation here as the rectangle that has, or, or the height of a rectangle that has the same area as the pink area. So we basically know that the area of a rectangle is the base, which is b minus a, so this distance here, times the height, which is the average value of the function. So base times height is equal to area, and that area is set equal to the integral, or dividing through by the base, or b minus a, we get the average value of a function is 1 over b minus a times the integral of a to b of f of x dx. So that's the math definition of the average value of a function, and then we can come back and look at it with the physics. A brief word about this notation, these little greater than or less than signs are not actually greater than or less than signs. Those are something that's called angle brackets, uh, which is just one of the many, many ways we indicate the average value of a quantity in physics. Uh, so we sort of look at them. They're a little bit wider than a greater than or less than sign if you're reading it. And so if you see them paired up like that, that's usually meaning the average of it uh, or the mean value of something. So let's apply the impulse to a problem like this, which shows the graph of force on a baseball while it is being hit. Uh, so it rises up shortly uh, to a very high value and then falls back down over a short period of time, one milliseconds to three milliseconds. We want to calculate the change in momentum on the ball, that's the impulse, and then the average value of the force. And to do that, I would calculate the integral of the area under the curve, which would be that area right there. Uh, but I'm not going to do calculus. I'm going to do geometry because this is a triangle and its area is a half base times height. Therefore, the impulse is going to have the same area, which is a half times the base, 2 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, it's a millisecond, and then the height here is going to be 18,000 newtons. And so the average value of the force then is just going to be, uh, 18, or the average value of the impulse is then going to be 18 kilogram meters per second. So that's the impulse and that's how much the momentum of the ball will change by. The next thing we want to do is calculate the average force. And so the average force is going to be the impulse divided by the time interval, because that stems from F average times the time interval is going to be the impulse. And so that's how we get to the result here. So we take our 18 kilogram meter per second, and then we divide it by the time interval, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, and that gets us to our average value of the force being 9,000 newtons. That's a lot of force. And this is actually a problem that we are treating in something that we call the impulse approximation, which means that there's going to be one force that dominates the dynamics of this baseball. It's the bat hitting it. There's other forces that are acting on it then. Maybe air resistance, definitely force of gravity. All these things are happening, but the magnitude of those forces is going to be very small, so we're going to neglect them. But it's only going to be small over the short period of time when this ball is being hit. Therefore, we neglect them, even though they'll be important over long periods of time, leading to larger changes of momentum. So that's often the impulse approximation. Let's consider some uh, other 
uh, kinds of impulses. Uh, this is a very mathy example that kind of illustrates what happens and how we can apply this mathematically. Uh, we imagine a particle with an initial velocity uh, that's given in unit vector form, so 3i hat plus 1j hat plus 6k hat meters per second. At time t, it's acted on by two additional forces, and they depend on time here, here, and here. And we want to know if the particle has a mass of a half a kilogram, what's its speed after two meters per second? So then we can calculate the initial velocity and we can calculate the impulse. And we know that the final momentum here, so we know, or rather we know that the final momentum minus the initial momentum is going to be the impulse. Therefore, the final momentum is equal to the impulse plus the initial momentum. Well, we can figure out the initial momentum uh, from the speed and the mass of the particle. So we know that P sub i is equal to m times vi is going to be 0.5 kilograms yep, times 3i hat plus 1j hat plus 6k hat meters per second. And so in the units, this is 3 halves i hat plus 1 j hat, oh, 1 half j hat plus 3 k hat meters per second. And then we calculate the impulse. And we can calculate the impulse as the sum, the vector sum of the individual impulses. So j1 is going to be the integral of f1 dot dt. And if we integrate that, that is the integral of 5i hat plus 2 inverse seconds times tj hat plus 1 inverse second times tk hat uh, dt. And, oops, sorry, there's Newton's dt. And that's going to have units pulling out all of the units to, uh, we'll do 1 kilogram meter per second out front. And then this is the integral of 5i hat uh, plus 2tj two, uh, two, uh, hat uh, plus tk hat dt. Integrating that gives me oh, from 0 to 2 seconds. And then we get the units. It'll be in units of kilogram meter per second. And then the integral of 5 in the i-hat direction is 5t divided from 0 to 2 i-hat plus uh, t squared integrated from 0 to 2 j-hat plus uh, t squared over 2 from 0 to 2 uh, in the k-hat direction. Uh, and integrating that out leaves us with... Uh, uh, sticking in 2 here becomes 10 i hat. Uh, sticking in this 2 here is 4 minus 0. So that becomes plus 4 j hat. And then sticking in my 2 here is 4, uh, is four over 2. Uh, so that gives us plus 2 k hat. And then the 0 terms uh, drop out. And then the units on the momentum are kilogram meter per second. Uh, and that gives us our uh, impulse in from the first force. The impulse from the second force, j sub 2, is the integral of f2 dot dt. And then that impulse is just going to be uh, this three integral of 3t squared, 3t squared i hat uh, dt times newton per second. And so that's going to be 3 squared is uh, from 0 to 2 seconds. And then 3t squared is going to become uh, just t cubed. t cubed i hat from 0 to 2 uh, seconds times newton per second uh, squared. Sorry, I forgot the squared right there. And then we'll plug that in, and that becomes 8. 8 kilogram meter per second in the i hat direction. Finally, we figure out the final momentum, pf, and that is equal to um, the sum of the two impulses plus the initial momentum, so pi 
uh, plus j1 plus j2 gives us our final uh, momentum. And so that's 3 halves i hat plus 1 half j hat plus 3k uh, hat uh, plus the impulse from force 1, which we calculated right there. And so that's 10 i hat plus 4j hat plus 2k hat. And then the impulse from J2, which is 8i hat. And this has all momentum units, uh, kg meters per second. And therefore, we get our final result for the momentum as uh, 3 halves uh, plus 20 halves is 23 halves. And another 16 halves is 39 halves i hat plus a half, uh, nine halves j hat plus, uh, let's see here, five k hat. Five k hat, again, momentum units. And then finally what we do is we figure out the velocity. So this gets us to V final is equal to one over M times P final. And that is going to, mass is a half, so this is 39 i hat plus 9j hat plus 10k hat meters per second. And then we apply the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the speed. And uh, this vector, when you calculate it out, has 41.3 meters per second magnitude. And that's the speed of the particle. All right, let's uh, return to baseball once again and consider this two-dimensional problem uh, where we have a baseball is thrown with a horizontal speed, hits a bat, and then uh, ricochets upward at an angle of 60 degrees above the horizontal to reach a maximum height of 50 meters measured from the height of the bat. We want to determine the magnitude of the net impulse of the bat on the ball. So that's going to be... Uh, the J is just the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Well, the other thing in the problem is it says neglect the weight of the ball uh, on, uh, i.e. the force of gravity, during the time that the bat strikes the ball. So this is going to have uh, a mass of 400 grams, uh, so 0.4 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared, that's going to be like four newtons. And this is going to be a much, much larger force acting on it. So we just end up neglecting it. Again, this is the impulse approximation. Essentially, during the period when it's being impulsed, uh, there are no other relevant forces in the problem. Okay, let's uh, figure out. Well, the initial momentum Let's not do some equal signs. Let's just figure out what the initial momentum is. Well, that's given by the speed. We're going to use a coordinate system, x and y. And so the initial momentum here is going to be equal to negative, uh, well, let's see here, the mass, 0 0.4 kilograms times 35 meters per second. And that's going to give me whatever my initial momentum is. My final momentum is not known, but I do know that it's equal to the mass of the ball times the speed to V2 uh, times the cos theta in the I hat plus V2 sine theta in the J hat, where theta is this 60 degrees right there. So I'll just note that that's equal to theta in my definition. So now we also know uh, that it reaches a maximum height of 50 meters, which is set by the vertical component of the speed. So basically also measured from the height of the bat. So this is at zero, and then it gets launched upward 50 meters from there. And we know in this case, this is a case of one dimensional kinematics under uh, free fall. So we'll use uh, the relationship that at 50 meters, it has a final speed of zero. So we'll use that V final squared is equal to V initial squared, which I'll just call v2 squared, minus 2 times g times h. 
and I'm going to say that that uh, final speed is going to go to zero at the apex of h equals 50 meters, and then that'll tell us that v, oh, sorry, that's, um, that's only the vertical component of this. So let's uh, take into account that, otherwise we're wrong. So it's v2 times sine squared theta, minus the aforementioned 2gh. Surprise, the vf still goes to zero. Uh, let's solve that, and we will get that v2 is equal to the square root of 2gh over sine squared theta. Uh, for those of you who are uh, following along, we would, have, we would plug in our 2, 10 meters per second squared for g, height of 50 meters, and sine of theta is equal to, um, uh, sine of theta would be root 3 over 2. But this gives us our v2, and now we can calculate everything uh, we want in the impulse, uh, which is that the uh, impulse here is going to be the final momentum which plugging in everything is uh, let's see here, 0.4 kilograms times v2, uh, which we don't know what it is, but it's the square root of 2 times 10 meters per second squared times the height of 50 meters, uh, all over the sine squared of theta. Sine squared of theta is 3 fourths, that's root 3 over 2 quantity squared, uh, square root, and then times the cos theta, which is a half, and so that's the v2 cos theta i hat term, so I'll stick an i hat on that, plus the v2, which is this same radical expression right here, 10 meters per second squared times 50 meters, all over 3 fourths, and then again the uh, sine theta is root 3 over 2 j hat, uh, and then we subtract from that the negative 0.4 uh, kilograms times, uh, or sorry, we sorry, the mass is positive, the speed is minus 35 meters per second, and this is in the i-hat direction, and if we go ahead and calculate this all out, we get an answer that this is 21.3 i-hat plus 12.6 j hat kilogram meter per second. And that gives us the tools that we need to figure out uh, what the total impulse on the uh, ball is. And if we knew how long this acted, uh, uh, we could figure out the uh, direction of the force or the direction of the average force. But again, uh, impulse is a way of not worrying about the particularities of what the force is doing, but trying to just trying to treat the before and after and throwing everything inside there into a black box. All right, I want to consider next what happens if we have a scenario where uh, we are throwing a baseball uh, or some other ball while standing on ice. Uh, you can exert a force on the baseball. Let's say you're the pitcher, so this force would be the force of the pitcher on the baseball right there. And as a result from Newton's third law, that baseball exerts a force on you, and they are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So if you think about this as a system, we can think about how what different things are in the interaction. So we're going to, as always, define our system by its boundary. And it's going to be the pitcher, the ball, and then the earth is outside the system. And what we're going to see is that within the system, there is a throw. And when we have this little drawing between them, this means that both forces are inside the system. Whereas if these little lines cross the boundary, that's kind of indicating that one force is inside the system, but it's Newton third law complement is outside. The throws force is inside, and then gravity and the normal force are all acting in the vertical direction. So I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to focus focus on the horizontal. And in a case like that, we can start to apply uh, our new version of Newton's second law, where we take Newton's third law, we'll pull everything over onto the left-hand side of this equation. We will 
rewrite that as Newton's second law, F equals MA. Uh, so those go in there. And then we will uh, we will um, turn this uh, acceleration into uh, the calculus definition. And we will recognize that this is just a time derivative or a time differential applied to some quantity under constant masses. And that quantity in there is in fact uh, the momentum. And in fact, it's the total momentum for the system if we treat it as a vector. And what's neat about this is that if the only impulses on the system or all of the forces that are inside the system uh, are, or all the forces acting on an object are inside the system, that system will conserve momentum. And this requires us to pay careful attention to what our system boundary is. Net external forces will change the momentum, just like net external works will change the energy. So we do have systems again, and we have changes in those momentum or energy based on impulses or works respectively. Well, we can actually use this conservation of agenda if we have U uh, standing on frictionless ice and throwing a baseball with an average horizontal force of uh, 500 newtons for 0.2 seconds. At what speed will U require re uh, re uh, recoil backward? Well, this is a case where all of the forces in the horizontal direction are inside this person baseball system. And as a result, we can say that there is no impulse on the system. So J in the, uh, or I should say J in the X direction is going to be zero. So this is no horizontal impulse. Thus, the horizontal momentum of the system remains constant at zero, because we will start at rest. And therefore, the initial momentum of the whole system will be zero. And that must equal the final momentum of the whole system. And that final momentum is going to be the mass of u times the velocity of u, plus the mass of the baseball times the velocity of the baseball. We're going to use our uh, variables like this, and we're going to define a plus x direction in the horizontal direction. Well, we want to figure out what the how fast vu is, or how big vu is. So we will solve that by finding out that vu is equal to negative mb vb over mu. Well, we are not given the uh, final speed of the baseball. We only know the average force for 0.2 seconds. And that means we know that the impulse, uh, the impulse on the baseball from the pitcher has a magnitude of uh, j, of the pitcher on the ball is going to have a magnitude of the average force. We'll just say it is FAV times delta T, and that's 500 newtons times 0.2 seconds, and that's equal to 100 kilogram meter per second. And then I can figure out VU by plugging that in as the momentum on the baseball. So this is equal to MBVB. Therefore, we will write down that this is minus 100 kilogram meter per second. And this replaces both of these terms uh, come in here. The negative sign is from our original derivation up here. And then we divide by MU, which is 50 kilograms. As a result, you get minus 2 meters per second. Answer? Complete. Let's try to not draw so terribly. There it is. Box the nerve. Let's try another example. Uh, 
A small block of mass M1 is released from rest at the top of a curved, frictionless wedge of mass M2, 3 kilograms, sits on a frictionless horizontal surface as shown. When the block leaves the wedge, its velocity is measured to be 4.0 meters per second to the right as shown in the figure. We want to know what the velocity of the wedge is and how tall the wedge is. And we can figure both of those out from our conservation laws. So step one is to figure out the velocity of the wedge. Again, we will use that the initial momentum of the system from starting at rest will be zero. And that must be equal to the final momentum of the whole system, which if we define an x, y coordinate system is going to be m1 v1 plus m2 v2 and the m2 and the v2 are we're actually looking for v2 and m1 and v1 are both given therefore i can solve for v2 as minus m1 v1 over m2 and i'm going to stick a negative m1 well that's uh, 0 0.5 kilograms times the four meters per second that's given in the problem right there and then we're going to divide by the wedge of the mass which or the mass of the wedge which is uh, three kilograms and this is going to come out to be minus two-thirds of a meter per second well that's neat and we'd like to know next how high is the wedge well this is set up in a scenario where uh the uh, acceleration on wedge 2 and wedge 1 are going to come uh, from the normal force interactions being kind of pushing at a weird angle that is part horizontal and part vertical. Uh, so the net effects of these forces are what are going to push mass 2 over to the left and mass one is going to the right, and these will sort of slide apart and sort of drift away. So we'll be able to figure out how fast uh, these are going from the momentum considerations, and then the uh, work done by those normal forces must accelerate both of those blocks uh, up to their speeds, and that has to come from the gravitational potential energy of the system. So there's no external work done on the system. Therefore, we get work is equal to zero is equal to the final energy minus the initial energy, and therefore the final energy must be equal to the initial energy. The final energy is just the kinetic energies of the two systems. So this is one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. Both blocks are moving, both carry a kinetic energy. And then the initial energy is m1 times gh. There is no m2 term here because uh, m2 isn't moving vertically. It's at the same height throughout this problem. Thus, to find out the height, we just find that 1 over m1g times 1 half m1v1 squared plus 1 half m2v2 squared. And then I can just plug in some numbers. m is 0 0.5 kilograms, uh, 10 meters per second squared. And then we get the 1 half. We get the 0 0.5 kilograms. And then however fast it was traveling, it was 4 meters per second quantity squared plus another 1 half. Then the mass. The mass is 3 kilograms. We're almost there. And then we get ne uh, negative 2 third meter per second quantity squared. And then we add all of that up and we get an answer that is uh, 2.13 meters. Pretty slick. We did it. Okay, so this uh, principle here really illustrates that um, the internal forces inside a system don't actually change its momentum at all. And this is a nice little lovely demonstration of this mathematically that was typeset by Dr. Kaminsky. Thank you very much for all of the help there. Thanks for the typesetting. And uh, what we've done here is we have written down all of the forces on 
a particle. So let's consider particle A, and these are all of the forces. So these are all the external forces, plus in a multi-particle system, the force of B on A, plus the force of C on A, plus the force of D on A, blah, 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 all the way up to however N bodies are acting on A, uh, that it, that's going to lead to the change in a momentum for particle A. Okay, particle B feels some external forces, plus the force of particle A on B, plus the force of particle C on B, plus D, etc. And then particle C fills a similar set of forces from everything, uh, leading to its change in momentum and everything. So we get this big giant matrix of forces that consists of two parts. The external forces that are acting on the system, and then all of these internal forces. But because of Newton's third law that allows us to say that the force of A on B is equal to the force of B on A, we can go ahead and cancel those forces out, which has been helpfully indicated by a little color ticker. Then we find the force of C on A, and that cancels with A on C, and then B on C cancels with C on B, D on A cancel, 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 uh, oh, I already canceled that. Oh, I was aggressive in my canceling. D on C, C on D, uh, C on N, N on C, dang, dang, bang. There's all this cancellation that happens. Something else has got to go away. That one already cancels. Man, I was hyper enthusiastic, but they all go away. It's a blowout Newton third law sale. Everything must go with the exception of all of the external forces. So if we add all of these up, we get the sum total of forces on anything in the system is the change in momentum of all the particles or the total change in momentum of the entire system. And if the external forces on the system are zero, then the momentum of that entire system is constant. And we've been using this with like two body forces, but it holds for so many bodies. Uh, it holds for, you know, Avogadro's number worth of bodies all because of this Newton third law, canceling out the internal forces so that only the external forces are changing momentum. So we're going to use these concepts of systems to consider the case of collisions under the impulse approximation. And so a collision is what happens when two particles or objects hit each other and interact through forces. And we're basically going to provide use the properties of these conservation laws to ignore the details of what's happening when these things are interacting with each other. We just kind of put that into this big black box that we call the collision, and we look at what goes into it, and we look at what comes out of it without a lot of concern for what's happening in the... We'll dive into that a little bit at the end of this uh, talk here today. So... It's worth noting that collisions don't actually need to touch each other. Uh, these particles can actually collide through uh, things like fields, magnetic fields or electric fields or gravitational fields. All of these can cause collisions, and so that'll uh, rep be represented as a collision on, uh, between particles, even if they don't physically touch. We just don't treat the details of the interaction, and then that's a collision. So the neat thing about this is we are going to apply our conservation laws to solve how some of these collisions actually work. So collisions in an isolated system have no external forces on them. Isolated system is uh, physics language to say that the sum of the net external forces is zero. Therefore, P total is a constant. And this is always conserve momentum. We further classify these systems as uh, given different words based on their energy conservation. If they are elastic, the energy is conserved in this interaction. Inelastic means it's not elastic or the energy is not conserved or it's perfectly inelastic. And that's what happens when two particles stick together after colliding. So let's consider starting with the bottom. 
perfectly inelastic one-dimensional collisions. Well, we have a system with a momentum, MA, and VA initial. So I'm going to use VA in the initial and then VB in the initial. And then these are going to slap together and all move off in one direction in the final state. So uh, when we do that, those objects that are going to stick together, we know that their initial momentum, and I'm being very kind of forward um, compatible by including these with vector signs on it, because this is something that also works in high dimension. So what's going to happen is we're going to have these two art objects come and stick together, and therefore they're going to leave the system in a final speed and then the masses are just going to be lumped together. So these two things are moving together at a common velocity. And therefore, we could figure out what that common velocity is in terms of the initial velocities and the initial masses. And that would give me everything I need to find final velocity. And then we can uh, look at how some of that mass energy is convert, or some of that collision is converted into energy. And I put a cryptic statement down here that for VBI equals zero, the final over the kinet initial kinetic energy is just the ratio of the mass to the sum of masses. Let's kind of think about what that means. And I'm going to say that we're going to do most of our collision work and explore the physics in the case when we set this initial ball's velocity equal to zero. So that's set this to zero, and there's only this uh, A ball's velocity coming in. And I'm going to give it a little prime just to indicate that we are in a different reference frame. And so we're going to study this collision in an inertial reference frame that is moving into this collision at the speed of the particle, so that in that frame, the uh, ball appears to be motionless. Ball B is motionless, and then ball A is going to come in and smack into it, and it's going to have a speed of VA minus that initial B. That's basically from our Galilean velocity transform, or a shift of frame of reference, we just subtract off the velocities from everything, and that'll give me my initial velocity. So in that case, we can write down the conservation of momentum. Only one particle is moving in this frame of reference. It splats into the ball, and then they move off at a second. And so that says MAVAI, prime, because we've subtracted off the velocity, is the sum of the velocities times the final velocity. And therefore, we get that this nice little ratio holds for what the final velocity is in, final velocity is in terms of the initial velocity. But it would be very good for us to transform back. And so we can go back to the result that we wanted before by taking the VF prime, which we've derived in this inertial reference frame, add to it the B velocity that we uh, originally subtracted off right up there. Uh, and then when we do that, we get MA over MA plus MB right here uh, times the final velocity, which, uh, or times the initial velocity right there, which is just the initial velocity in the unprimed reference frame minus uh, VBI. That's this definition right there. And then we add to it VBI. And then if we combine our denominator, uh, or find a common denominator, add in, that'll end up canceling one of these minus VBIs with this MAVBI, we'll cancel with another MAVBI. And we'll get back to the exact same result here that we had back here uh, for what the final velocity is. So this shows that we get the same physics irrespective of what we set uh, VB to. And therefore, uh, by doing these kind of velocity transforms, we can get out of the frame into any arbitrary uh, reference frame. So this is going to simplify our lives because we're just going to analyze collisions for the most part in the case where the second tar the target ball, MB, isn't moving. It's just going to simplify things. So let's... Uh, 
reconsider what's happening here. Uh, so if uh, the VB is zero and we figured out uh, VA, and we're just gonna drop the prime frames and kind of call the VB initial equals zero frame as the regular frame. And then if I calculate my final over my initial kinetic energy, I just take one half total mass times V final squared. And when I do that, I get the ratio of the masses to the sum of the masses times the initial velocity. And I plug these uh, numbers in, I do some canceling here, and I get that this ratio is the mass ratio of the original target to the sum of the masses after they splatted together. And that's necessarily going to be less than one. So in perfectly inelastic one-dimensional collisions, the kinetic energy is lost, and it tells you how much in terms of a ratio is lost here. So let's uh, take an example of this, that a bullet with a mass of 0.1 kilograms is really moving along here at 1,000 meters per second. It's fired into a clay uh, block with a mass of 9.9 .9 kilograms. And it's gonna slide up this random ramp and we wanna find out how high up vertically it's gonna travel uh, with G is equal to 10 meters per second. So we can take this uh, using the perfectly inelastic collision model and we will say that the initial momentum, which is just the bullet over here, and then the combined momentum are going to be the same. So the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And then what we'll do is we will say that this is equal to the mass of the bullet times the original velocity of the bullet is equal to the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the clay times the final velocity of the clay. And then what we want to do is figure out how far up this ramp it'll travel. And so the way we'll figure that one out is by saying, well, after the collision, one half MB plus MC uh, times the final velocity squared, the kinetic energy, is going to be the gravitational potential energy of where it stops, times G times H. And we're going to solve for h those masses cancel out and we are left with h is going to be equal to v final squared over 2gh or sorry over 2g uh, and then that is going to just be give a v final is just going to be um, all together m b v b over m b plus m c that's the speed quantity squared over two times G. And let's plug in some numbers. We got uh, 0 0.1 kilograms times 1,000 meters per second divided by 9.9 .9 plus 0 0.1, kind of chosen to be uh, a little neater for some reason, uh, squared over two times 10 meters per second squared. And so that's uh, 0 0.1 divided by 10 is 0 0.01 times that is 10. Uh, so this internal goes to 10 meters per second. Quantity squared is 100 meters squared per second squared divided by 10 is 10 divided by 2 is equal to 5 meters. And so that's our answer. Sales 5 meters up the ramp vertically. All right, for my next trick, uh, I want to kind of consider what's going to happen if the masses do not stick together. We're going to assume that VBI is equal to zero here, but afterwards VBF is no longer going to be equal to VAF. So the final velocities of these two particles will not be the same. And in general, we're going to have the masses in the problem. And we will, if we want to figure out what happens afterwards, we're usually just given what the VA initial is. Uh, VB is going to be zero. And then we come out with an equation, one equation that has two unknowns in it, VAF and VBF. No longer know what they do. So what we're going to need is another constraint on the system. Two, equation, two unknowns means I need two equations. Well, the way we're going to find that is we are going to look for uh, energy conservation. 
And if no kinetic energy is lost in the system, we get one additional constraint, which is the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy. And we're going to combine that with the uh, velocities here, uh, or the momentum uh, equation there. And we can use this and a glorious pile of algebra, truly wonderful, covered in your book. Uh, but the outcome of this is that the final uh, velocity is just 2ma over ma plus mb times the initial velocity. And the final velocity is ma minus mb over ma plus mb times the initial velocity. So this says that the velocities are just going to be determined by the mass ratio of the system. And so we'll explore this a little bit better the main, oh, in class, but the main thing we needed here was we needed one equation and we needed a second equation. And the combination of those two are what allow us to solve this. Notice that this bottom one is a vector equation. So every time I, as long as I have two particles, I'm always going to get another kind of couple of constraints out of it. Um, or another couple of equations out of it as I go to higher dimensions. So it tells us we're going to need some tricks. But the point is, is that once I incorporate an energy constraint, then I can solve my collision problems. But what if it's not perfectly inelastic? And what if it's not perfectly elastic? And in that case, we need a different kind of uh, equation. And this is something that we call the coefficient of restitution formalism. So we think about this in terms of two things splatting together and then kind of bouncing off of each other. And so in this case, we kind of split our motion into these two stages where they come into contact with each other and then they squish down and deform each other. And there's all these kind of forces acting on the system uh, as they squish together. So the basketball over here and then the soccer ball here both kind of squish into each other and then they rebound and spring apart. And we mathematically are going to describe that using the internal impulses of the system. So we're going to kind of treat this in two phases. The first is we have the forces that a particle experiences internal to itself. And what that's going to say is that whatever forces are in this kind of a squishy interaction phase that's happening here, they're going to have some sort of forces of compression and I can calculate their impulses, or at least I can write down an expression for their impulse that says that for the initial momentum of the soccer ball, uh, for clarity, this is going to be MA at VAI, and this is MBI, and this is MB. And what's gonna happen is these particles are going to squish together and then the impulses of all the forces inside the ball of uh, the basketball are gonna kind of push together and slow down this initial momentum to a point where it's traveling at some unknown speed V. Similarly, the forces, and this is gonna be considered an entire system here, the forces inside the soccer ball are going to squish down and slow down uh, the soccer ball from whatever it's traveling to plus the impulses to get it moving at uh, speed or a velocity V. I don't know what that is, but they are moving together briefly, instantaneously. And so they're all squished together and moving together at speed V instantaneously. And Notice that these carry opposite signs. That's because as a system, all of these forces are going to have Newton third law pairs. They cancel each other out. But if we're considering on a case by case basis, we can kind of divide those two forces into uh, what's acting on ball A and what's acting on ball B to slow them down. So this kind of describes mathematically how these balls squish together and they're kind of scrunched in here together. And then they're elastic, so they spring apart. Boing. And what happens there is they experience forces of restitution. 
and we're going to define those forces like the p the compression earlier as r and we're going to calculate their impulses and we're going to say that the uh, momentum from when things are stuck together to the final momentum is going to be changed by those forces r similarly the ball b is going to be pushed apart by the um uh, restitution forces there and we're going to get to our final uh, uh, velocities for these two particles once they are traveling apart uh, separately at um, m uh, sorry that's going to be v a final and this is v a uh, v b final so they're pushed apart so what we're going to do is we're going to define the coefficient of restitution and the coefficient of restitution is going to define as the integral of the restitution force impulse over the restitution over the integral of the compression force turned into an impulse and so it's this ratio of these two impulses here and the key insight this actually harkens all the way back to newton so this is a newton another law is that like the coefficients of static friction and kinetic friction the coefficient of restitution is largely a property of the materials involved in the collision and one can write down and adopt a constant coefficient of restitution for certain collisions now we can go through all of the physics all of the momentum and it is even more exciting algebra than calculating the elastic uh, collision uh, coefficients but we come up with an expression that the coefficient of restitution if it's known sets the ratio of vb final minus va final divided by va initial minus vb initial and this is saying that the coefficient of restitution is giving us a scaling of the relative separation velocity relative to the relative approach velocity so this bottom is how fast they are coming together and then the top is how fast they are moving apart. I will note that for a perfectly inelastic collision, perfectly inelastic, then E is equal to zero because VB final is equal to VA final. And so the top cancels out. In a perfectly elastic collision, you plug in all the numbers and you find that E equals 1 for perfectly inelastic, perfectly elastic, perfectly elastic. And so I'll finally note that uh, 0 is less than or equal to E is less than or equal to 1. Uh, so it's just a number between 0 and 1. So let's apply this as our final trick of the day. Let's figure out the um, collision between two disks, which are sliding on a horizontal surface with masses two kilograms and four kilograms respectively, and they have the velocities that are shown, so two and five meters per second. And what we would like to do is we would like to know um, what their uh, velocities are just after the central impact when they collide with each other. Great. So given this setup, uh, we can figure out what the uh, final um, velocities are using this coefficient of restitution formalism. So first off, we get the conservation momentum. So we know that MA VA I plus M B V B I is equal to M A V A final plus M B V B final. And we also are given that the coefficient of restitution has uh, this formula that is equal to V B final minus V A final over V A initial minus V A uh v b initial and i'm just going to call this bottom part here equal to delta v and for clarity that's v a i uh here minus the negative five meters per second 
for VBI. We are assuming a positive X direction uh, coordinate right there. And so delta V, just for clarity, is two meters per second minus negative five meters per second. So that's equal to seven meters per second. And if we look at epsilon at E, and so E times delta V is just going to be 2.8 meters per second. So no matter what, they're going to be drifting apart at 2.8 meters per second, because uh, E is equal to 0.4, as given in the problem right there. Well, let's um, go ahead and use this uh, expression. Uh, what we're going to figure out is that, uh, let's see, E times delta V is equal to VB final minus VA final. And I'm going to take this whole expression and multiply it through by MA. So MA E delta V is equal to MA VB final minus M A V A final. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to that the conservation of momentum. And I'm also just for uh, values going to call that PI. So anything in red, I know from what's given in the problem. So I'm just gonna use those and plug those in as numbers as I sort of sort uh, solve everything here. So then I know that P initial is equal to M A V A final plus M B V B final. I'm going to take these two ex uh, equations and add them. So I have my initial momentum plus M A times E times delta V, and we're going to end up canceling M A V A final with the negative M A V A final there. And then we are going to be left with M A plus M B times V B final, which is something I can solve for V B final, is going to be P I plus M A E delta V all over M A plus M B. And then everything on the right hand side of this expression, I can just calculate. So Let's do that. So the initial momentum of the system is uh, MA VAI, so that's two meters per second times the mass of A, which is two kilograms, plus the mass of B, which is four kilograms, times its velocity, negative five meters per second. That's just the value I have. Plus, and then I have my mass of A, which is two kilograms, times my coefficient of restitution, 0 0.4, times my uh, velocity difference, which I argued was seven meters per second. And so this expression here, I'm going to then divide by the sum of the masses, which is again, uh, six kilograms, that's four kilograms plus two kilograms. And out from this is going to come up minus 1.73 meters per second. So we figured out how fast B is moving using this coefficient of restitution relationship. Then the next thing that I'm going to get out of this is that VA final from the coefficient of restitution relation right here is going to be equal to VB final minus the coefficient times delta V which is going to be minus 1.73 minus 0 0.4 times seven meters per second. And that's going to be equal to minus 4.53 meters per second. So you might not have actually seen how to use coefficients of restitution to solve a physics equation like that, but it's uh, really quite a nifty little thing if we get the coefficient of restitution just given to us like that. So. Just as a recall, this is the key expression from the coefficient of restitution, which is the relative separation velocity divided by the relative approach velocity has a fixed ratio in um, the coefficient of, uh, in physics problems. And so we can usually just specify that and that gives us this extra constraint we need 
to solve the um, conservation momentum during collision problems. Okay, so that uh, covers what I wanted to talk about in the context of momentum. Uh, next week, we will go into two-dimensional collisions, variable mass problems, and the ideas of center of mass, which will allow us to calculate a few more things. And then we'll actually bring these all back with all of the conservation laws and dynamics to kind of put a capstone on uh, what we call sort of our particle dynamics course before we head on into rotation. So uh, that's all for uh, right now. I will talk to you in class. Bye-bye.